Lord be with you. I hope you'll join me in turning in your copy of Holy Scripture to the fourth gospel, John chapter 20. We'll be reading verses 19 through 31 there. <coughs> Excuse me. Pray some of this rain washes off some of this pollen, then be all right by me. So. John chapter 20, beginning with verse 19, reading through verse 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, O God, give us ears to hear, ears to hear your words and not mine. May we hear your words, Lord, as they call us to do what you call us to do, as you call us, Lord, to be the people you call us to be. Be with us, O God, and speak to us that we may be forever changed more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. You know, <clears throat> it has always interested me how people tend to get more religious in the wake of tragedy. You see, television reports, newspapers, and articles with titles like Finding God in the Midst of Devastation. People who would never darken the door of a church or bend a knee in prayer suddenly show up at the front door. They need help. They want somebody to pray with them. They need shelter. Sometimes people go the other way and get more religious by becoming more vocal in their disgust with religion. They blame God for whatever tragedy has struck them. And who can blame them, though, really? I mean, you turn on the news, they're on the television and on the radio. There are all these people talking about that this devastation is, is God. It's God who has brought such a devastation as a judgment upon a wicked nation or wicked people. So they curse the heavens and the God that they imagine dwells there. And then they may even reject assistance from a church or from other religious organizations because somehow they think that they're subtly behind their misfortune and they're just seeking to profit from it by adding another person in the pew. Whatever the case may be, it seems that when tragedy strikes, some people get more religious and start talking different, walking different, showing up. And then some 
Some get a little more vocal in their anger. Whatever the case may be, it seems that when these sort of things happen, people begin to see them as signs. Signs of God's presence in their midst. Of course, who can blame folks for wanting a sign? Wanting to see something. Wanting some tangible evidence of God. My grandma used to tell me, don't believe anything you hear and only half of what you see. It's not an uncommon philosophy for many folks today, especially in an era of fake news we hear all about. Folks have a difficult time believing what they're told. Don't you believe me? If you don't, that's proving my point, right? People have a hard time believing what they're told. They have a hard time believing what they read. We don't believe what we're told anymore. We don't believe what we read, what somebody just says to us, because we've been let down too many times. Maybe it's by a politician who's been unable to live up to campaign promises. Or maybe it hits a little closer to home. Because we all have that loved one somewhere who tells us, this time, this time I'm going to get clean. This time I'm going to quit. This time I won't ask for any more money. This time I'm better and I'm ready and I'm fixed. I'm I'm clean. I'm good to go. And they let us down. We just don't believe what we hear anymore. We need proof. We need evidence, papers, receipts, something, tangible evidence. We want some collateral when it comes to believing someone's word. And perhaps that's why people tend to wax religious in the wake of tragedy. Because somehow in the midst of confusion, despair, and horror, there is some kind of tangible proof that it's God. There's something bigger than us at work. I suppose it was that very same sort of feeling that caused the first followers of Jesus to look for a a sign after Good Friday. For years, their their life seemed to be heading in an overall positive direction. They had a Messiah now. He, He had done miracles. He taught with wonderful stories. Even walked, laughed, and and ate with them. He was right there in his midst. He didn't feed 5,000 and then whistle for his taxi or for his limousine. He was there with them, right there. They had proof of a bona fide, genuine Messiah. He was right there. They could smell him, touch him, listen to him. And what more would you want when you're following a Messiah than one you could put your hands on, a Christ who was there? But then Friday came, and Mark, Mark's words always haunt me a little bit more than the other Gospels when it comes to Good Friday. Mark says, when they came to arrest Jesus, Mark says, all of them deserted and fled. All of them. Nobody left. They left right when Christ could have needed them most, right when their faith was tested the most, and they left. And then, tragedy. Jesus is crucified. Surely the movement is over now. The movement was surely doomed. As Christ was crucified, the disciples scatter. They're all long gone. None of them seem to really believe what Jesus said. He told them at least three times. Don't worry, guys. I'm going to be arrested, crucified, but I'll be back on the third day. None of them seem to have believed what he said. None of them. And then Sunday. Sunday dawn, and with it came the hope of all humankind, Christ's resurrection. But the disciples didn't see it. In fact, you know something, we don't think about this very often. Nobody saw it. Nobody. Nobody saw what happened. Nobody was there. The Gospels don't say how it happened. It doesn't say that there was a bright light from the tomb, that Jesus evaporated from the grave, or that Jesus somehow just suddenly... St- no, there's no, no detail whatsoever. We're only left with the stories, the stories after his resurrection, in the dim hours of Sunday morning, and we're only told about it. Don't believe everything you hear, right? So it doesn't come as a surprise to me, then, that when it was evening on that day, and the disciples are all meeting behind locked doors, that Jesus comes, stands among them, and says, Peace 
be with you, and shows them his hands and his side, and it's then that the disciples rejoice. Not at the news from Mary Magdalene, not at the news from the disciples who had been there and said, we saw the empty tomb. No, when? When Jesus is there, and there's proof, tangible evidence. Jesus just shows up. He doesn't knock on the door. He doesn't turn the knob. He just shows up. Not like David Copperfield. He doesn't use smoke and mirrors. He's there in this supernatural way. Shows up through the shut doors three days after his very public death. He just shows up and shows them his hands and his side. Here it is, boys. Proof. Proof. Tangible, physical evidence of the resurrection. Of course, the timing of all this is important. This is after Good Friday, and here is Jesus giving them proof. However, there is so much more he gives them than just some visible evidence, for he says to them in verses 21, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I sent you. And then in John's version of Pentecost, Jesus breathes on his disciples and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. There's a whole bunch of sermons to be preached on that one sentence. Forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. But if you hold on to them, they're held on to. It's what he says to them. It's more than proof. In the wake of Good Friday's tragedy, Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit onto his disciples and gives them peace. I want you to consider the magnitude of that thing. Jesus doesn't just show up and say, everybody calm down, I'm not dead, it's all right, it's okay, we can get back to what we were doing, it's all right. He doesn't do that. He doesn't show up and and, and just say, I'm not dead and you can't. Jesus doesn't show up and begin to tell them these things. In fact, he doesn't give an explanation. He doesn't say, this is how it happened, this is where I've been, this is what's been going on. This is not some systematic theology of the atonement. Jesus doesn't show up and say, all right, fellas, let me explain to you what all of this means. No. He shows up and says, peace. Gives them peace. And then breathes on them the Holy Spirit, charging them with the duties of a follower of Christ. In the wake of tragedy, Jesus offers peace and a commission, the commission of the Holy Spirit. Now, now what's interesting about this story to me is that the disciples who were there, well, they saw Jesus. They saw Jesus when he granted them peace. They saw Jesus, had eyes on him when he breathed the Holy Spirit. There's visible evidence. It's still there for them. So really, really, I don't think Thomas's actions the ones that we tend to focus on in this passage, shouldn't come as so much of a surprise to us. In verses 24 and 25, the Bible says, Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, we don't know where he was. Maybe he was out taking a stroll. Maybe he had to check the mail. Maybe he said, hey, fellas, I got to go home. I left the lantern on. I don't know. He wasn't there. So the other disciples told Thomas when he shows up, hey, guess what? We've seen the Lord. He says, no, I'm not buying it. Unless I see the marks of it. Now, the language is, is tough. It's almost like he's bullying them. Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands. Which, by the way, only place in the gospel that nails are mentioned. In all four. You can look it up. It's in, but in the gospel, the only place. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my finger in the mark of the nails, I will not believe. That's like put my finger in the hole, and my hand in the side. I don't buy it. Now maybe, maybe Thomas had in mind Jesus' words from the 13th chapter of Mark. There Jesus says, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. So maybe, maybe Thomas just wanted to be sure that this was actually Jesus. Not somebody parading as Jesus, not somebody uh, in a beard as Jesus, nothing like that. And he wanted to make sure, maybe, that it was Jesus and he wouldn't be led astray. But I doubt it. Thomas, Thomas just wanted what we all want, what the other disciples had. He 
wanted proof. He wanted to see it with his own eyes. He wanted to see the telling signs that it was Jesus, the signs of his crucifixion, his physical body that would prove his resurrection. He wanted to see them because the other disciples had gotten to see them. Don't we do that? Boy, I wish I had their faith. Why does God talk to them and not to me? I wish. I remember when I was in college, I had a friend named Jeffrey. We were talking one day on the porch of a place. We were on a little retreat. He was telling me about how the first time he had spoken in tongues. I remember going back to school and praying, God, why, why can't I do that? I'd like to do that. If that's real, God, let me do that. If it's real, well, I'm a Baptist, so you can figure out the rest of the story. But, but I asked him, don't we do that? Somebody else has proof. I want it too. I can't blame Thomas. He wanted to see the scars because the other disciples had gotten to see them. Of course, the odd thing to me, at least, is that when Jesus shows back up, he gives Thomas what he wants. A week later, today, the disciples were in the house. Thomas was with them this time. He learned his lesson. Don't, don't leave, you'll miss out. Thomas is there. Although the doors were shut, again, Jesus comes in, stands among them. Peace be with you, he says. And then almost like, like Thomas is in the corner, he turns to Thomas. Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand, put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. You know what's interesting? We're not told if Thomas does it. We're not. Oh, you might see paintings where, but we're not told in the text. All Thomas does is all that we can do. My Lord and my God. Jesus showed up, and, but he offered Thomas to touch his wounds. Here it is. Undeniable proof. Yet I wonder if Jesus wasn't just a little disappointed with Thomas. I mean, can't you hear it in his voice in verse 29? Have you believed because you have seen me? Now, the New Revised Standard translates it as a question, but a lot of other translations make it a declarative statement. You have believed because you've seen me. The existential theologian Rudolf Bultmann went so far as to claim that the resurrection appearances of Jesus occurred simply because the disciples didn't have enough faith. That if they had had enough faith, Jesus would have never had to have occurred to them. That he, would have, he could have just resurrected, raised, went on to heaven, and nobody would, they would have had enough faith. But they didn't. So Jesus appears to the disciples to seal the deal as a sign. That's what brings us all the way back. Thomas, along with the other disciples, desired some sort of proof of Jesus' resurrection after Good Friday. After they had seen the crucifixion, they needed to see the resurrection. They wanted a sign. And that, my friends, may be the greatest example of irony in all of the New Testament. Because in the fourth gospel, in which Jesus, Jesus does all of these works, he does absolutely no miracle. The word miracle isn't there. No, the word that the author of the fourth gospel likes to use, sign. All of these signs Jesus did. In fact, the last words of the text we've read this morning sum up the author's use of signs quite well. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The author wrote down these signs so that we may believe. Yet there are still countless people, particularly in the midst of troubled times, who turn their gaze towards the skies, shake their fist and say, Give me a sign. We all do it. I think sometimes we all find ourselves looking, praying, Hoping, asking for a sign. It doesn't have to be a bright neon arrow, but give me something. 
Lord, which way do I go? What should I do? Give me a sign. But we should not give in to the simplistic idea that faith is based on what can be seen, and therefore proven. Because sometimes faith isn't about asking and getting a sign and following it. Most often faith is about going on when there is no clear sign and trusting that God goes with you anyway. For all, the faith can be proven with tangible evidence. Can you really call it faith anymore? I don't think so. In the midst of those times when we find ourselves needing a sign from God, we hear a better word from Jesus. For just as he appeared to Thomas for the sake of his faith, Jesus also spoke these words to Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That's us. If you are one who's looking for a sign, I'm going to tell you something. You can find one. You can buy one on eBay. You can find a Cheeto in the shape of Jesus. You can buy a tortilla. Maybe not just with his face, but maybe all of the Last Supper. Who knows? A grilled cheese sandwich. You can find a sign if you're looking for one. You can find a sign in the rain this morning, in the chance timing of a song on the radio. You can find it. If you want to prove God's existence in the terrifying forces of nature, you can easily do it. You can. Just claim God is in the storm. If you want a sign, you can find a sign. But for every sign that you find, there's always the doubt. It's always there. That doubt that maybe, maybe this isn't a sign. Maybe this is just coincidence. Maybe this is just an attempt to practically explain away something miraculous. But you can always find one. You can always find a sign. However, we are called to a faith in things unseen. To a faith witnessed for us in the pages of Holy Scripture in the lives of those saints who have gone on before, in the lives of those who are even in our presence now. Jesus says, those who believe without seeing are blessed. And in the midst of tragedy and despair, he offers peace and the comfort and the commission of the Holy Spirit to those who believe. So I wonder, do you really want a sign? Should we really want a sign? Give me something. Do you really want some tangible, recordable evidence of the existence of God and the presence of Christ? Something that you can hold in your hand that can be written off, ignored, explained away, or forgotten? Or do you want something even more real than that? Will you let go of that human desire for proof and cling instead to Christ? who offers peace that surpasses all evidence and hope. A Christ who offers love that doesn't make sense. Who offers comfort that doesn't fit in times when it shouldn't. Peace that goes beyond our understanding. Would you rather cling to a Christ who offers us hope in the things we can't see? If you call on Christ's name today, you will truly find in the joy in the midst of heartache, Love in the midst of grief. A spirit-breathed life of Christ's peace with you when it doesn't make sense, when you can't prove it, when everybody thinks you're crazy and you don't have a sign to tell them why. If you just cling to Christ. That's a whole lot more than what can be captured in a sign. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us when we doubt. But Lord, show us that through that doubt comes faith. Forgive us, Lord, when we seek tangible proof. And all the while you are speaking into our lives and showing us who you are. If we but simply take the time to listen and believe. Help us, God, even now to recognize your presence among us 
And may that presence, Lord, call us to a deeper life of faith. And God, help us to respond to your call in your presence as we come to this time of invitation and response this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.